Please stand if you're able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <coughs> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this 
this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. to God's people on earth. Lord God. Let us pray. Lord God, your loving kindness always goes before us and follows us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps in the ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Isaiah. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, the Lord brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in a darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exalt when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord. We'll read responsively Psalm 27, verse 1 and 4 through 9. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter, hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary, and raise me high up on a rock. Even now, my head is lifted up, and my enemies to surround me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifice in the sanctuary, sacrifices of rejoicing. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me, and answer me. Hide not your face from me, turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast not me not away, you have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied in its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel comes to us today from Matthew chapter 4. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what, may be, what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I invite our young friends forward for the children's sermon. Good morning, ladies. Today, I have what? Say it. Hang. Hang spider. I know. I like hang spider better. All right. So you've got the spider web over there, and we've got a little drop down, and we have a big long word. So, who's ready to start us out? Yes. A. A. It's on there. There we go. Boy, that took a minute. Clear at the end of a long word. Alice? G. G. G, we've got a body for our spider. Yes, ma'am. N. N. 
Yes. There we go. Yes. Oh, <laughs> ah, that was tricky. <laughs> All right. Yes. C. C. Thank you. Yes. I. I. Okay. Yes, ma'am. E. e, yes. Alice, say it again. L. L, yes. You had one, Riley. You. you. Okay, we got a leg. Yes, ma'am. W? W, we've got another leg. Uh-oh, we've got two legs on an eight-legged spider. Yes, ma'am. M? M? Uh-oh, this is getting tricky. Three legs. Alice? H? H? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Four legs. R. R, yes, R. Got one more letter, yes ma'am. And T, thank you. Whew. I was afraid that spider was gonna become whole. So what's that word? I know, right? Rec Reconciliation. 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 Can you say it? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Yeah, it was in our Bible reading in our second lesson. Reconciliation. Paul was talking to some people and he was like, come on, you got to do this reconciliation thing. Reconciliation, what on earth could that mean? Well, ladies that have friends here, especially, tell me friends, have you ever been in a dispute or an argument or a disagreement with your friend? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> And, and um, have you ever been in a dispute, an argument, or a disagreement with the friend you're with right now? Uh-huh, really? No kidding. <laughs> and um, so are you still friends? How did that happen? You what? You forgave each other, right. You made a decision to get along, right? You, did somebody say they were sorry? Yeah, did they? And then someone else said, it's fine, it's fine. We'll get along again. That's what, that's what Paul was telling us in the lesson, was that that's a good thing to do. That even if we're not friends, we need to try and get along with each other. Do you have friends at school that you're not friends with? Are there people at school that you're not really friends with? That you, do you have to get along with them anyway? Yeah, yeah, that's called reconciliation, yeah. Even if you have a dispute, you have to do that, I'm sorry, and get along with them, right? Yeah, reconciliation, yep. Make up, get along together, make friends again. Who helps us do that? Right? Yeah. How? Oh, tricky question, right? Anybody have any ideas how Jesus helps us with this? No? Should we ask them out there? I think that's a great idea. So what do you think out there? Reconciliation. 
how does Jesus help you with reconciliation? Because he forgives our sins. Oh. Grandma's got the word, doesn't she? <laughs> because Jesus forgives us, that helps us know how to forgive each other, right? Yep. Yep, that's, that's how we can reconcile with each other when we've got a dispute, right? Yeah. So let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for reconciliation, for reconciliation the, way you teach us the way you teach us to forgive, to forgive and get along with each other. Help us to do this, do this. Even, with people even with people that we don't usually get along with. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for coming up. And boy, I hope we've got the goods today. Thanks for coming up. Let us pray. Holy, mighty, and loving Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here safely. Thank you for the warm church when it's cold outside. Thank you that you have brought each and every one of us here that we can join together as one to praise your name. May our praises be sweet to your ears. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. Well, if you've been paying attention to Matthew, Jesus has been doing some moving around. For the third time in Matthew, today Jesus finds himself embracing a new hometown. You remember Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and being born there, that fulfilled a prophecy. And the first time he moved, he was fleeing with his family to Bethlehem from Bethlehem because Herod's furor and he was going to, G- to Egypt. Again, with Jesus fleeing to Egypt, his life paralleled or looked a little bit like Moses' life. The second move allows the family to return to Israel after Herod's demise. But the reign of this, his progeny, his son, leads the family to resettle in Nazareth. In doing so, prophecy was fulfilled again. And now this third move brings Jesus to Capernaum. And again, a prophecy has been fulfilled. In other words, never are these moves rooted in human will. Instead, Matthew argues that God has carefully orchestrated these geographical dislocations and thus imbued them with great significance. And what is that significance? Perhaps here is where we get a glimpse of Jesus' traveling, his moving existence. From his days through his adult life and ministry, Matthew's Jesus is an itinerant preacher, a constant wanderer. Jesus does not opt for the comforts of the familiar, but he embraces God's call to find those who are in need of a word of God wherever they might live. After all, this is the message of the prophecy The God has promised to reach all the nations. Light has reached those who formerly dwelled in darkness and death. Jesus has come to them and, in a sense, become one of them by becoming their neighbor. Moreover, Jesus' first ministry 
locale is known as Galilee of the Gentiles. So from the first, and in consonance with prophetic promise, Jesus ministers in an ethnically diverse land. You and I, we live in a, in a very mobile society, in a very diverse culture. For many of you, you have not moved very far from where you originally started out. But then there are the rest of us that have moved quite a long ways. And Jesus' moves are, in some sense, familiar to those people who have moved about a bit. The dislocation of a new place and new neighbors can be both thrilling and intimidating and exhausting. New surroundings can provide us a new start, a nearly blank slate that might allow us to recreate how others perceive and how we perceive ourselves. New surroundings can also cause us to question every dimension of ourselves. Moving causes us to ask anew, who am I? The richness of diverse communities can help us understand others better, but also ourselves. In Matthew, Jesus' moving experiences must have shaped his perspective, helping him to understand a community as both insider and outsider. In Capernaum, Jesus picks up the proclamation of John. John's arrest in chapter 4, verse 12, marks a critical transition, but not an entirely new path. The basic proclamation of both is identical. John and Jesus say the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And later, Jesus will send his disciples to preach the same message. At the same time, John himself promised that Jesus would be a more powerful and more important figure in this story. What's the shape of this reign of God? How is Jesus uniquely bringing it about? The power of Jesus' call becomes quickly evident. The call of his first followers is profoundly inspired Jesus doesn't have to pitch the idea to these individuals, nor does he need to persuade them. After all, each has little reason to leave their current way of life. Each of these new disciples has a steady job, and more importantly, they have family ties to their vocations and their locations. At the same time, these are unlikely to be individuals of great social power or individual wealth. These fishers are not among the elite of ancient culture, Through Je though Jesus' disciples will play a vital function in the earliest days of the church. On this day, they are utterly ordinary individuals called to an extraordinary task. I imagine that they would not have completely understood what it would mean to become fishers of people at the moment, yet they follow without hesitation. Many came to John seeking his baptism, and here Jesus calls a small circle of people to follow his wandering path of preaching and healing. So, now he's begun to assemble his disciples, and Jesus turns to his work. He teaches in the synagogues. He pronounces the good news of the kingdom. He makes the sick and infirm whole. And these will be the defining characteristics of Jesus' daily labors in Matthew. Teaching, proclaiming the kingdom, and healing are integrated components of his ministry, not just bits and pieces. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Spoken nearly two millennia ago, how does this promise now function for us today? 
Is the kingdom of heaven still drawing near even today? Can you observe the close connection of preaching, teaching, and healing in Jesus' ministry? The proclamation of the kingdom is not just verbal, not just teaching, but a series of actions designed to bring wholeness to individuals and to communities. The reign of God has dawned not only because Jesus spoke it into existence, but also because he was willing to heal the sick and make whole the broken. So it is not a point of embarrassment for us that Jesus proclaimed the dawning of God's direct rule over the world so very long ago. For he believed it deeply and enacted powerfully God's reshaping of the world. And now here we are, two millennia down the road. We too can announce that the kingdom has arisen. The work of proclamation, teaching, and healing that Jesus brings, it, brings to the world in this ethnic hotbed called Galilee has continued throughout the centuries. In fact, Jesus' closing word in Matthew commands the continuation of this life-giving work. All the disciples are called to go and make disciples. How then are we to proclaim today, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near? For too many people today, such an utterance is something we associate with a wild-eyed preacher who has lost contact with reality. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come nearer. But perhaps these few verses proclaimed this Sunday can help remind us of Jesus' life-giving words and deeds. Perhaps these few verses proclaimed this Sunday can help remind us to proclaim the drawing near of God's reign, not as a threat, but as a life-giving promise. May this promise give you renewed faith in that promise. Amen.
Please stand as we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Called together through water and the word, we boldly pray for the church, the world, and all who long to hear God's voice. Holy One, your voice calls us to follow. Thank you for raising up missionaries in every generation and for all who create communities of grace today. Open our hearts to serve you near and far. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Maker of all, we rejoice in the beauty and abundance of the earth. Unite us in, your, in our shared calling to be stewards of creation, to reduce waste, and to simplify our lives for your sake. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Ruler of all, thank you for those who run for local and national office and for all who serve as elected leaders. Gather wise and courageous voices together, that your mercy and justice would dawn upon all people and nations. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Healer of all, thank you for sanctuary and safety. Uplift all who live where fear governs and evil divides. Give refugees and all who seek safety a path toward hope and new life. Grant healing and wholeness to all who are sick, lonely, or grieving. We pray especially for the family and friends of Gary, for those we've named on our prayer list, and for those we now name silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, God of courage, thank you for faithful teachers and evangelists in this and every place. Inspire our faith formation efforts with all generations as you call us to follow. Bless our children, youth, and adults who engage in learning. Lord, in your mercy. Your Risen Lord, we marvel at the meaning of your resurrection. Give us faith to place all hope in you as we give thanks for the faithful departed. May their witness help us follow your call. Lord, in your mercy. We place our prayers before you, God, united by, in your spirit, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please exchange that peace with one another.
Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God. We give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God. We give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God. We give you thanks. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle our, your gifts within us. Renew our faith. Increase our hope and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.